Canada's last frontier lies in her frozen north. Its almost legendary Northwest Passage, goal of explorers looking for a route to the Orient, was first navigated by the Norwegian Amundsen from east to west between 1903 and 1906. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police schooner, St. Rock, reversed Amundsen's historic voyage, traveling from Vancouver to Lunenburg via the Northwest Passage, the first time that the trip had been made from west to east. On June 21, 1940, the St. Rock left Vancouver with supplies for Royal Canadian Mounted Police detachments in the Western Arctic. The voyage planned as an extension of the St. Rock's routine Arctic work extended Canada's knowledge of and control over the immense resources of the North. The St. Rock had to force her way through heavy seas in her voyage north, but the stout little vessel was built to withstand tough Arctic weather. St. Rock in constant touch with Royal Canadian Mounted Police Headquarters. At Accutan in the Aleutian Islands, the St. Rock paused briefly. Here the crew saw large colonies of sea lions playing in the water and diving off the rocks. surrounded by his harem, and he fights jealously against any rival who intrudes. Sea lions are great swimmers, and one of the first things a mother does is to force her baby into the water to teach him to swim. But sometimes he's a difficult pupil. As the St. Rock approached Point Barrow, Alaska, the most northerly tip of the North American continent, she encountered the first flow ice. From here on, the skipper, Sergeant Henry Larson, with continuous service on the St. Rock since 1928, had to be on constant guard. The vessel's timbers are two-thirds heavier than normal, and her hull is sheathed with Australian iron bark to resist the grinding of ice. Often, the little schooner was stopped by slob ice. Cautiously, however, she barged her way through. Ice flows of great depth often extend for miles. There are no icebergs in the western Arctic. A sharp lookout had to be kept for uncharted reefs and shallow waters, and the hand lead was used 24 hours a day. Some days brought clear, fine weather, many fog and blizzards. Walrus are an ever-welcome sight to the Eskimo hunter, for their blubber provides light and heat for the igloo, and their meat, food for dogs and Eskimos. The walrus lives on clams, which he digs from the ocean's bottom with his gleaming white tusks. Walrus are dangerous when attacked, especially the seal eater.
some walrus weigh as much as a ton. Occasionally, the St. Rock stopped and filled her water tank from freshwater pools found on large ice floors. The water had to be tasted before being pumped aboard, as it might be brackish from saltwater spray. The polar bear, monarch of the polar seas, lives chiefly on seals, but during the summer months is often found inland, eating grasses and mosses and fishing for trout in streams. Actually, he is not white, but cream in color. Some weigh as much as 1,500 pounds. The polar bear is good food for dog or man. With 5,000 miles of her voyage completed, on August the 31st, the St. Rock reached Cambridge Bay, one of the Arctic outposts of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which are annually serviced by the schooner with supplies and fuel. For both outpost personnel and the natives of the Arctic regions, the supply boat is often the only contact apart from radio with the outside world. At Cambridge Bay, the first husky dogs, later to be used for patrolling, were taken aboard. An Eskimo and his family joined the crew here, for later an interpreter would be needed to deal with natives seldom in contact with the white man. The Eskimo woman is expected to undertake every task necessary to existence in this barren Northland. To permit freedom of movement and provide a safe place for her child, she fashions a baby carriage so that she may work unhampered. Eskimo women have been known to bear a child one day and on the following day be on the trail. The copper mine Eskimos are among Canada's happiest citizens. They live to hunt and hunt to live. On September the 25th, Sergeant Larson chose Walker Bay on the west coast of Victoria Island as the site of the first winter quarters. Being relatively free of heavy polar ice, it filled most conditions of a good winter harbor, and the ship was anchored about 300 yards offshore in 30 fathoms of water. All oil and gasoline fuel was unloaded onto the beach in case of fire, and heavy cargo and boats were sent ashore. This lightened the ship before freeze-up and made it easier to cut the ship out of the ice in the spring breakup. To ensure a good supply of fresh fish, preparations were made for fishing under the ice at a nearby freshwater lake. For good results, this required a special technique. First, the water was sounded, then a series of holes through the ice. A line to which one end of the fish net was attached was threaded through the holes by means of a pole. The net was then drawn under the ice and sunk. Wooden staves were next placed in the holes and the ends of the net attached to these staves so that there was no danger of losing the net when next cutting into the ice. The results that winter were delicious lake trout. By October 30th, the St. Rock was in position for winter quarters and all hands were kept busy constructing the ship's winter overcoat. A wooden framework was constructed over the deck, and this was completely covered with canvas, converting the schooner into a snug and warm workshop. With daylight hours fast shrinking, no time was lost in securing the winter's ice supply from a nearby freshwater lake for fresh water aboard ship. The dim twilight hours found the crew cutting and laying away over 500 blocks, enough to last until the melting of the snows. The St. Rock's crew, Constable Hadley, Constable Farrer, Constable Perry, Constable Peters, Corporal Foster, Constable Hunt, Constable Charton were all well equipped from head to toe to withstand the winter's chilly blast. 
It's impossible to exaggerate the importance of the husky in the Arctic. His weight averages 75 pounds, and he's expected to pull a load equal to his own weight, pound for pound. There are many different tribes of Eskimos. Basically of the same race, they often display quite distinct physical characteristics. The high cheeked copper mine Eskimos contrast sharply with the flat Mongolian appearance of Eskimos at Walker Bay. In winter, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police travel by dog sled in the Arctic. The runners of the sled are mudded to make travel easier. Vegetable matter from a lake is boiled and placed hot on the runners. Freezing immediately, it is then shaped for the raft, and many films of ice are added with the wet bearskin mitt to make the runners slide easily at low temperatures. Although the St. Rock was frozen in, the routine work of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police never stopped. Meteorological work was carried out at the base camp, and dog patrols were undertaken, the longest when taking the Eskimo census. In 61 days, 1,100 miles were covered in weather never less than 40 below zero. Many Eskimo villages were visited, where health checks were made, general statistics of the natives and game in the locality were taken, and general police work was carried out. Eskimos in the spring of the year often use caribou skin tents. The huskies are not welcome visitors to the igloo or tent. This wonderful animal lives outside all the year round. An Eskimo shows an Arctic newcomer how to build an igloo, which for a trail camp can be built in one hour. The Eskimo cuts his blocks of hard snow with a 16-inch bladed knife. The blocks are trimmed with a slight curve. And as each tier is raised, the angle is made greater until on top of the igloo, the blocks are laid practically flat. The blocks freeze together at points of contact. The cracks are filled with loose snow, which is soon frozen solid, making the igloo draft proof. A hole is kept open at the top for ventilation. The completed igloo is a perfect dome. But while patrols were out, work continued at the base camp without let up. The first mate explored the local country dressed in two caribou skin suits. The inner with fur next to the skin and the outer trimmed with wolverine. The staple food of the Eskimo is the common hair seal and this mammal furnishes his every need. The intestines, which the Eskimos eat with great relish, furnishes vitamins. Sewing thread is made from the seal bladder. The bladder, also being very transparent, is sometimes stretched and put to use as igloo windows. The blubber provides heat and light for the igloo and is sometimes eaten by the Eskimo in small cubes for a laxative. Seal meat is high in food value and good for man and dog. The skin is used for footwear, watertight clothing, and for dog harness. The Eskimo prefers his food raw, and in winter, usually frozen. Huskies are fed about three pounds of meat or fish each day. Sometimes these dogs can become most savage, especially when hungry. The husky puppy somewhat resembles a chow. Always a great favorite with children, his training as the workhorse of the North starts when he's about eight months old. Some huskies are born to be natural leaders. A dog with these qualities will be singled out as a lead dog a position he jealously guards. During the 10-month stay of the St. Rock at Walker Bay, the detachment was visited by many natives. In some ways, they resemble Arabs, for they are truly the nomads of the north, never settling down at one place, but always on the move. A few days, unlike their oriental cousins, they do not silently steal away. Far from it, for the bustle of packing up, hitching the dogs to the heavily laden sleds, the goodbyes and the ever-present barking and yelping of the huskies make a noisy farewell. <laughs> Eskimo
Eskimos are the happiest citizens in Canada, despite their continually harsh struggle for existence. Practically untouched by the ravages of civilization, these primitive and carefree people still live like their ancestors. In May, the ice showed signs of thawing, and it was time to make the St. Rock ready for the actual trip to the Northwest Passage. Before the breakup, the stern of the ship was cut free, for the rudder and propeller were embedded in solid ice. If this had not been done, there was danger of the vessel being heaved up during the thaw. The stern post and propeller, which would still hold the schooner tight in the ice, would be damaged. Though the work was hard, the now lengthening hours of daylight, along with the prospect of once again getting underway, spurred the crew on to greater efforts. Spring had come at last to Walker Bay. The men seized every opportunity to savor the beauties of this wonderland. Where once were ice and snow, now appeared green meadowland. Fresh water made a pleasant change from melted ice. But spring did not interfere with the overhauling job. Sails were examined, machinery overhauled, and the hull scraped and painted. Sergeant Larson, who was responsible for the safety and efficient operation of the entire voyage, exercised his skipper's privilege to take a few hours off to fish for Arctic trout. The Eskimos themselves fish for these trout by partly damming a stream and spearing the fish when they're caught in the shallow water. came, and with it the birds of the north, geese and other varieties of waterfowl. Caribou are found in most parts of the Arctic region. During migration season they travel in vast herds. Mating time brings about fierce battles between male rivals, which sometimes result in locked antlers and death. Caribou meat is used for food, both for man and dog. The skins make fine tents and clothing for the Eskimos, and the sinews along the caribou's back are used for thread. Sometimes the fat of the animal is used like seal oil to give heat and light, and is also made into candles. Moose are occasionally seen on the mainland of the western Arctic coast. By the end of July, the St. Rock, after being frozen in for 10 months, was ready to continue on her journey, but was held up several days by heavy inflowing polar ice. Collinson, a famous Arctic explorer, had wintered in this spot a hundred years before when searching for the lost Franklin expedition. Before heading for the Northwest Passage, it was necessary to backtrack for freight received by way of the Mackenzie River, Toktoyaka. This was destined for copper mines, Cambridge Bay, and other detachments. Although heavy ice was all about, by using caution, a safe passage was steered. Tuck the Yaktuk occupies an important position in the Arctic region near the Mackenzie Delta. On August 4th, the schooner reached Tuktoyaktuk, where the Hudson's Bay Company has established a trading post. The lumber for the buildings was all brought in by a river, for there are no trees this far north. The freight was loaded on board, and the Huskies were taken ashore for a brief taste of freedom in new surroundings. 
arrival at Tuktoyotuk -tuk coincided with a visit by schooners. Eskimos from distant Arctic islands come to trade at the Hudson's Bay Company post. Though an individualist, the Eskimo has shown his capacity for cooperation in the joint ownership of these schooners within his community. Many fine skins, chiefly fox, come from the Arctic islands, and the Eskimo exchanges them for white man's cloth, weapons, ammunition, and many other useful commodities. The skins of the white fox and other fur-bearing animals are the currency of the Arctic region. Washing clothes is an event for it happens once a year when water is plentiful. A famous trader and explorer in this region, Ole Anderson, visited the St. Rock. The interpreter, George Porter, went fishing for herring at Tuk Tuk with real success. At Tuk to Yuk Tuk, the skipper measured off lengths of lightweight canvas for the Eskimo to take home to his wife to be made up into parkas for the crew's fur clothing. These coverings not only acted as a windbreaker, but also kept the fur clothing clean. The skipper drew a good bargain with the Eskimos for the work to be done. Now the St. Rock entered upon the actual Northwest Passage. Proceeding south of King William Island, much shallow water and many reefs were encountered. The compass was useless as an aid to navigation because of the nearness of the magnetic pole. When the sun shone, the sun compass was used. And when the weather was clear, land was in sight. Constable Farrar, the first mate of the St. Rock for 10 years, kept a constant lookout from a lock for reefs. A ship of more than 12-foot draft could not navigate this route through the Northwest Passage. No vessel of the St. Rock's draft had passed through these waters before, and many times she scraped the ocean bottom. Existing charts were very unreliable for these waters, but the little ship was handled by an expert crew which kept her safely on course. Ice flows of enormous depth and extending for miles held up the St. Rock. These ice flows have little time to melt away for the Arctic summer is very short and the polar sea is cold. In these parts, the ice cannot drift to a large expanse of water to break up and melt completely because it is locked in by many islands and narrow channels. The weather had turned foggy, slowing down the progress of the little ship, but she plowed her way cautiously to Peterson Bay. And here, after 11 months, the interpreter said goodbye. His little son had provided the crew with many a happy moment, and the father had proven himself not only a good interpreter, but also an able guide and an expert snow house builder. Peterson Bay was the site of Amundsen's first winter quarters in 1903 when this explorer navigated the passage from east to west. His winter here was commemorated with a cairn, but weather had since obliterated the writing on the plaque. Passing through Franklin Straits recalled the greatest of all Arctic tragedies when Sir John Franklin in 1847 a British explorer lost both his ships, the Erebus and Terror, with their crews of 134 men, frozen to death after their ships were crushed in the ice north of King William Island in trying to find the Northwest Passage. A terrific Northwest gale struck at the St. Rock, caught in the grip of the ice, was pushed into Paisley Bay for eight miles across sandbars, with only eight feet of water over them. The St. Rock ended up 50 yards from shore, surrounded by heavy polar ice, which froze solid September the 11th. She was frozen in for another winter, and there she remained for a long 11 months, her second winter in the Arctic region on this historic trip.
Being so close to land, it was not practical to hitch up the dogs to haul the cargo ashore, and the men pitched in to the job themselves. To relieve monotony, every effort was made to keep occupied at some useful task. One of the best morale builders was hard exercise, and lots of it. The St. Rock was again converted into a winter workshop. As a change from routine work aboard the vessel, the men read and listened to the radio. When the weather was suitable, outdoor sports helped keep the men in trim. the previous year, winter quarters were visited by Eskimos. Those who came to Paisley Bay were from some of the most primitive tribes in the Arctic. Many of them had hardly ever seen a white man, and both the ship and its crew were objects of considerable curiosity. Miles from the nearest trading post, or Royal Canadian Mounted Police Detachment, they lived a simple existence in the barren Northland country. When these Eskimos want to show affection by a kiss, they rub noses. As everywhere in the Arctic, the husky dogs played an important part in life at Paisley Bay. Long patrols inland were undertaken carrying the work of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police into many remote regions of Boothia Peninsula. On February 13th, Constable Charton died of a heart attack. A mission priest, Father Henry, marched over 800 miles to Paisley Bay to perform the burial. Then members of the crew erected on the shore overlooking the bay a large stone cairn and cross to mark the grave of their comrade. Like so many men before him, Constable Charton died in the performance of his duty and a nameplate surmounted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crest marks his resting place. Records of the ship voyage are deposited within the cairn. The long winter wore on while the men carried out their duties policing Canada's vast Northland. At last, warm winds, melting snows, blue skies, and thundering waterfalls heralded the approach of spring. Machinery overhauled and the ship cleaned from stem to stern, the St. Rock was under sail again in August. For 23 days she was caught in the ice pack and drifted helplessly in Franklin Strait. However, she managed finally to drift through the narrow Ballot Street to Prince Regent Sound, then through Lancaster Sound, a Navy Board Inlet, to Pond Inlet, where the dogs were put ashore at the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Detachment. The St. Rock proceeded into Davis Straits homeward bound. The schooner operated on only five of her six cylinders, for on August 12th, number one cylinder had broken and flooded the main engine. But Corporal Foster, with many years as chief engineer aboard the St. Rock, kept the diesel engine running. As the ship headed east, the eastern Arctic shoreline contrasted sharply with the western. Through Davis Straits, the forbidding, mountainous coastline of Baffinland was always in evidence. Many giant icebergs were seen in majestic and fantastic shapes. Nine-tenths of an iceberg is submerged underwater. water. 
southbound for calmer waters, the barometer and radio reports forecast rough weather ahead. All loose articles on deck were lashed down and every precaution taken to ensure the safety of the vessel. icebergs southward. Often an iceberg, as it grows top-heavy, rolls over. The icebergs, riding deeply, drift their own way southward. It is their last few months of life, after hundreds of years of slow flowing in glacier form, from the lofty Arctic mountains to the sea, where they break off in gigantic and striking shapes and drift away to individual existence. At last, the St. Rock reached calmer seas. As though to herald the approach of the St. Rock, homeward bound after two years fighting her way through the Northwest Passage, a whale and swordfish appeared off the bow near the coast of Nova Scotia. Convoys appeared on the horizon, transporting vital materials of war for our allies abroad. Never watchful eye for the undersea prowlers, the submarines. Near the coast of Nova Scotia, the St. Rock passed a graceful schooner, homeward bound from the fishing grounds. On November the 10th, 1942, the St. Rock entered Lunenburg Harbor. The historic voyage was over from Vancouver, British Columbia, over the top of the world to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. This sturdy schooner had covered over 10,000 miles in 28 months, carrying on the work of a famous police force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Pitting her strength against the toughest elements in the world, the St. Rock and her crew had challenged the Northwest Passage and won. The King's Polar Medal, made of silver with a white ribbon and awarded in recognition of polar exploration, was given to each of the eight members of the St. Rock's crew for their part in this historic and gallant voyage. 